I want to welcome you today, and we have a very special guest with us. Uh, he really needs no introduction, but I'm going to try to do that anyhow. Uh, his name is Ken Blanchard. He has authored uh, 20 books at least, perhaps more. Uh, one of the books, of course, that most people have heard about is The One Minute Manager, which has sold over 10 million copies, about 25 different languages. And even this last week, uh, still ranked in the top 10 the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times best-selling list. So, so, Ken, that's a tremendous record to have a book written 20 years ago and still selling that well. Well, it really is amazing, uh, Mick, and I think that was the beginning of my whole spiritual uh, awakening and everything because that was so ridiculously successful hmm. that I was either going to get a big head or wonder what was happening. And so, luckily, I, I went for wonderment. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderment. And uh, I knew God was involved somewhere because I had kind of turned my back on the Lord for a good 15 years after a friend of mine who was a wonderful minister got fired in an unchristian like way in Athens, Ohio for leading sit ins in the 60s against mm. the war and all that. And, and, I was probably uh, in his group. <laughs> he sure. <laughs> and, uh, but because um, that book, you know. Mm. If I really knew what made that happen, then, you know, I would be God. And so I decided I wasn't. <laughs> you know, some of the things in that book, though, are so practical. And I mean, then you wrote the one minute, putting the one minute manager to work with Bob Lorber, who's been on our show. And um, some of the other books, uh, the one minute manager meets the monkey and mm -hmm. uh, gung ho, raving fans, high five. And the list goes on. Uh, would you see what is? Is there a reoccurring theme, even though some of the topics are different? Uh, a reoccurring theme running through those books. Well, Mick, the mission of our company is to be the world's number one advocate for human worth in organizations. So the theme that goes through everything that I've written is uh, the worth of human beings mm -hmm. and how much it's the job of leaders and managers is to bring out the magnificence in in people. I don't think people get up in the morning and go to work and say, I wonder how I can mess up and mm -hmm. goof up people's lives. I, I think people want to do well. I ask people, would you rather be magnificent or ordinary at work if you had a choice? And everybody says magnificent. <laughs> yeah, we see a lot of ordinary behavior, and I think that's because managers aren't you know, bringing yeah. out the best mm -hmm. in people. So I think that's a theme sure. that constantly is going on. I pick that up uh, in those books, and every time I hear you speak, even if it's a different topic, that is a constant theme that I hear running through, just the worth of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why those books not only sell so well, but they're so effective when you, you read them, because they're really dealing with the real issues where people are that, that make them better leaders no matter what area they're leading in. Well, and, and also I think make it's important to understand that it's not soft management because, uh, um, you know, I, in the One Minute Manager, we had a saying that people who feel good about themselves produce good results. And that's mm -hmm. true. You feel good, you work harder. But when Bob and I did putting the One Minute Manager to work, I realized I might have got caught in the old human relations trap, which is, you know, you run around trying to make people feel good in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And so Bob and I changed that quote. So in putting the One Minute Manager to work, it said people who produce good results feel good about themselves. And so I try to point out to people we're not just talking about trying to make people feel good for mm -hmm. feel good sake, but organizations have goals to accomplish whether sure. they're profit, nonprofit, Absolutely. and all. And so you want people to perform better mm -hmm. in an environment that permits them to grow and be the best. What are some of the organizations that, that you work with, your, your company? Well, uh, we work with a lot of different organizations. The, the ones that, to me, are the fun ones are the ones where they're really trying to make a difference. I've had an awful lot of fun working with, with Chick-fil-A, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, they are mainly in the southeast uh, and sell chicken, but mm -hmm. uh, they're not open on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, their mission is to really basically use the talents that the Lord has given us to uh, have a positive influence in, mm -hmm. in terms of everybody sure. who comes in contact with Chick-fil-A. And, and I remember following the president, Jim, president, Jimmy Collins, in one of their big conferences, and he said to all the managers, and they have over a thousand stores now, if, if you're going to err with our people, please err on the side of mercy. Hmm. And when I got up, I said, you know, do you all realize where you're working? I mean, there's not many organizations like this. So as a result, they have only 5% turnover in their restaurant managers, which is unheard of in that field, and 50% less turnover in the hourly. And so I just love with the work with companies where 
they have a very clear vision and set of values and are trying to implement it and, and, uh, and make a difference. So they're, they're one uh, example. I'm a great admirer of uh, Bill Pollard and Service Master, mm -hmm. you know, another sure. great company. They're different than Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. in that they're a public company, and, but their goals uh, that are right in the center hall there are number one to honor God and everything they do, number two to develop people, and number three to pursue excellence, and number four to grow profitably. Sure. And they say that the first two are their ends goals and the last two are means. The reason to pursue excellence and to grow profitably, you can do more good for the Lord and you can develop people. Sure. And uh, so this year when the stock market took a <coughs> shot at them because they had a merger that didn't work out as well, mm. Bill Pollard got in front of the board and said, let me make two comments about the recent development of Wall Street. Number one, I recommend you buy. He <laughs> uh, says, it's a great price. Sure. And number two, trust me, trust what we've, sure. we've done. And so those are fun kind sure. of organizations. Do you, uh, how would you say over the last 20 years, organizational management has changed? Has there been a, a, a change, uh, a trend that you've seen? Well, I think the biggest uh, change, Mick, is much more focus on the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, uh, if you, you know, abused customers, they didn't have any choice. Mm -hmm. right. And there's really not a business uh, today uh, that people don't have a choice. I mean, even in the regulated industries, I mean, they all know it's coming. Uh, and if uh, you abuse a customer, they go somewhere else. Sure. And so I think that's been a very positive thing that's changed a lot of, I think, uh, some of the self-orientation around organizations to realize that your customers really write your checks and they're the ones that you have to focus energy on. And to make a difference in your customers, you have to focus on your people because they're the ones that make sure. the, the difference with the customers. And then... You know, I always say is if you have raving fan customers and gun ho people, your cash register goes ka-ching, ka-ching, mm -hmm. ka-ching. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's a, a big change. People are starting to more and more sense that there's a triple bottom line rather than just the concept that mm -hmm. it's, it's our profit or the money that makes a difference. You've got to take sure. care of your customers and your people. So competition in one sense drives us back to some very good principles that actually do work. Mm -hmm. so competition's a good thing. It exposes some of the dumb things we're doing. I know Warren Buffett used to say that uh, when the tide goes out, you discover who's been swimming naked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> the competition does help help uh, right. expose some of the flaws that we have. And, no. gee, they're going over there. I better... And then you discover that these principles back to the, the customer, the person, and yeah. how important that person yeah. is. Well, I've seen that, uh, too, in the whole... Uh, uh, faith area in churches, you know, and sure. because for years, you know, people have a low school church and there wasn't a lot of alternatives, but uh, there's a lot of alternatives and people will shop for a church, which was not uh, to, exactly and so churches have to be much more interested in their congregations and their needs and much more uh, customer focused than they were in the past. So you go into an organization and uh, you're going to help an organization, what what would be one of the big struggles that you would encounter when you go in there? One of the obstacles, I guess, would be a better... Well, the biggest obstacle in most organizations is that they've been set up in the past as if the sheep are there for the benefit of the shepherd mm -hmm. and all the power and money and status flows up the hierarchy. And, and so breaking that mindset uh, is tough because the people at the top of the organization, quote, have more to lose, you know, in sure. their own minds and yet if you're going to really compete with your customers you have to really kind of for implementation turn the pyramid upside down and focus all the energy on the customers which means empowerment which is about sharing information and all those things and and uh, getting that done is really interesting. I had a fun experience recently with a restaurant manager owned a bunch of restaurants and we we're saying you got to share information with your people because uh, you know, they ought to be your business partners. And he was really reluctant. So we went in one night into one of his biggest restaurants. And uh, before they closed down and all the customers were gone, we got all the employees out in the dining room. And 
on tables of you know six or eight people, and we had the you know the chefs and the dishwashers and the bell, I mean the uh, bus boys and the waiters and waitresses and all. And what I said to them is, uh, at your table, why don't you come to agreement of every sales dollar that comes into this restaurant, what do you think falls to the bottom line in terms of profit that can go back into the pockets of the owners or put back in the business? And the least guessed at any table was 40 cents. Several tables guessed 70 cents, you know. And you know enough about the restaurant business. If you can keep a nickel, you know, you're doing real well. I mean, 10% is mm -hmm. just unheard of yeah. in the restaurant business. But if you don't share information, see, they think this is a money machine. So mm -hmm. you talk about breakage in terms of taking food and all. I mean, they could care less. It was really interesting. In this case, the chef said, you mean, if I burn a steak that costs us $6 and we sell it, you know, for um, 20 and we're going at a 5% uh, margin. I mean, I, I got to, you know, we got to sell five to 10 steaks for nothing uh, to make up for my wastage. I mean, he's starting to calculate right sure. away. And uh, because they need to have the information. Mm -hmm. Years ago, when we didn't have computers and all, you could say, well, how can I share all this information now? Anybody in the organization can push the button on a computer and get the same sure. data as the chairman of the board. So uh, mm -hmm. it's empowerment, it's focus on the customers, there are major mm -hmm. changes. And I've noticed too, over, you, you, you tie in a lot of leadership principles to the Bible. Um, and when did that take place, that whole revelation in your your life that, well, that I these principles were in scripture. I mentioned early on is that I started to really wonder what was going on when the one minute manager came out right. and early on I was on the hour of power with Bob okay. Schuler. Sure. and uh, Bob said to me uh, as he's interviewing me on the one minute manager he said Ken Jesus was a classic one minute manager and I'm like what? He says yeah he was real clear on goals hmm. And he said, you know, you and Peters didn't invent management by wandering around. He said, Jesus did. He wandered around from one city to the other. And she said he'd praise people, he'd heal them and all. If they got off base, he reprimand. wasn't afraid to give them yeah. a reprimand sure. and all that. And I went, whoa, that's really <coughs> interesting. And as I got more in my own spiritual journey, what I realized is that the, the Lord's hand has been in my whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he knew I would come around eventually, but what has happened is that everything I've ever taught, Jesus did. Sure. I mean, you know, he hired 12 incompetent guys. You know, mm -hmm. the only guy who had any education was Judas, and he was his only turnover problem. And, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I teach situational leadership. He was a situational leadership. I taught mm -hmm. one-minute manager. One-minute manager, you know, one-minute manager meets the monkeys. Jesus would not take a, your Great monkey book, by on. The way. You know, he would just push it back mm -hmm. and say, okay, you know, and then he'd tell a story. You know, tell a parable. I mean, so um, it's uh, just been amazing to me about what a model, because of all the the religious leaders in the world, he's the only one who really ran an organization. Sure. Uh, the rest were, you know, kind of secluded and mm -hmm. all. And he got and, out and in the purposeful world. Purposeful training. I mean, yeah. he perp on purpose was training guys. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and he was interested in you know, than what's the legacy, what's the future, sure. and. And they, he not only trained his disciples, but had them train others. Yeah. And so, um, so it was. Uh, you know, one of the things you do that I really love is that you've developed a common language, uh, and I, I think this needs to be done even by more and more by ministers. Mm -hmm. But you're, here you are, this uh, international management consultant, human development, productivity, and you have done. Uh, what I feel is an incredible job of developing a common language between the business world and the principles in Scripture. Mm -hmm. You don't speak a foreign language. You don't speak Christianese. Yeah. When you talk, I mean, whether you're talking to Ritz Carlton or some other big organization, uh, you talk from a business point of view, but you're tying in principles from the Bible. How important is that, that common language? you as you communicate? Do well, you see a difference, I, people responding differently to you when you do that? Well, I think that the main issue in life is communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if I want to teach, I want to communicate. And therefore, I can't use a language that separates and all. I remember my father, 
if it was a lousy preacher at the church came in, he'd leave and look for another church. You know, sure. my mother's brother was a pretty devout Episcopalian. He'd say, what do you mean this looking around for a minister? You know, the church is the church. And he said, look, he said, you think Jesus was a good preacher? He said, yeah. He says, if he wasn't, you never would have heard of him. That's right. And so, I mean, hmm. because, you know, he talked in the most wonderful mm -hmm. parable simple way that everybody could understand because his message was for everybody mm -hmm. not for the educated elite mm -hmm. and uh, so what I'm trying to do is is get a message to mm -hmm. as many people as possible therefore I don't want a language that separates sure. a language that distances me and I think that uh, I think people kind of forget that sometimes who are teaching the Bible they get up in the clouds and you know, sure. in their own ego and try to make it sound. Scrape the Milky Way. Yeah, like yeah. it's rocket science. and uh, when Business people do that too, though. Yeah, oh, for sure. So you've developed a common language yeah. in both fields. Yeah. And you've merged them. And, and I yeah. think uh, that's why you're, you're such a good communicator. Yeah. And, and I think that's so important to do for people to have that common language. And like you said, Christ was in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. He That's spoke right. parables that these people were absolutely familiar with because that was how they worked. Sure. It was stories from their life. Yeah. But the, the thing you said, too, the, the intellectual elite also got it. Yeah, that's right. And some of them were ticked off because they didn't say sure. it that way. Yeah. He was so well, good. Well, it was funny. You know, when the woman and manager came out, I was, you know, still uh, on the faculty at the University of Massachusetts, you know, and a lot of the faculty couldn't believe I would write a book like that. I had sold out, you know. Sure. Imagine writing something you could really understand. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because that's right. the way we kind of distance mm -hmm. ourselves. And that's why, you know, one of the things that drives me crazy in organizations and in schools and all is this whole normal distribution mentality that you're supposed to sort people out. No, I think we're supposed to make people win. So mm -hmm. if you're going to try to do that, you want a language, you want a way to invite people in rather than to separate out. Well, you taught. You were a professor. Yes. For how many yeah. years? Ten years, yeah. Ten years, and how did you teach your classes? Well, I was uh, investigated by a lot of the best faculty committees because the thing that drove it's them the crazy. the story of your life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always gave out the final exam the first mm -hmm. day of class, and they couldn't believe that, you know. And, I'd say I'm confused, and they say you act it. And I said uh, I thought we were supposed to teach these kids you are, but don't give them the questions in the final. And I'd say no, no I'm not going to give them the questions in the final. What do you think I'm going to do all semester? I'm going to teach them the answers. So when they get to the final exam, they win. Life's all about winning, and and so this whole thing of sorting people out. I I was amazed, like the people were picking on the state of Texas. I guess you know they have a lot of tests that the state has, and they're accusing the teachers of teaching for the test. I said, why wouldn't you? I mean, you want your kids to fail? And so they act like they should be teaching something else that's bigger than the test and then let the kids take the test and fail. I mean, why are you giving them the test if you don't want the kids to pass? Hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, just, that's one of the stupidities about education in this country is you think it's a sorting out process. No, it's, it's a process of how do you get the greatest number to a, a level of understanding that, that, that we want. So uh, I've heard you say that feedback is the breakfast of champions. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, if you really want to improve, mm -hmm. you've got to constantly have people share with you on how well you're doing so you mm -hmm. can keep on. But if you cut off feedback, you're not going to grow. And you know, the reason feedback's the breakfast of the champions, I mean, imagine somebody trying out for the Olympics and nobody will tell them what their times are or, mm, yeah. you know, how far they've jumped or That's a good point. at all. And yeah. so, uh, and people who are servant leaders love feedback. You give them feedback, they thank mm -hmm. you and, you know, tell me more. Is there any, where people who are mm -hmm. self-serving, they hate feedback because they think it's suggesting that you don't want them to lead and that's their biggest fear. Sure. They want to hold on to their positions and so, uh, to me, feedback is a gift. Mm -hmm. And when somebody gives you a gift, you first thank them. Mm -hmm. And then you always ask, is there any special instructions that go with it and all, you know, which is tell me more and all that. And uh, if you're open to feedback, you can constantly grow. Feedback it is really- It takes a pretty strong ego, though, to do that. It really does. And, uh, and to realize that, that you're already okay, that's- You have to believe in, in yourself yeah. in that sense, yeah. that you're okay. 
And, you know, the way that comes about, I think, is uh, near-death experiences really help people get out of their ego's way, and a spiritual awakening is, is tremendous. And then, you know, who your leadership models. Sure. That's why I am spending so much time suggesting to people that lead to Jesus was a fabulous leadership mm -hmm. model. And, and I tell them, I'm not trying to convert anybody. In fact, you know, I got enough trouble with believers of Jesus uh, using him as a leadership model. I don't have to go out and recruit anymore. Sure. Uh, but he's a marvelous uh, model. And, and it's a great model. Uh, yeah. And it, it works. I mean, mm -hmm. the principles are there. That's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you, you also talk about positive addictions. Mm -hmm. These are like breakfast of champ, uh, feedback, the breakfast of champion, positive addictions. Mm. You have a way of putting things. What do you mean by positive addictions? Well, I first got that w uh, concept from William Glasser, who wrote a book called Positive mm -hmm. Addiction, which is we all know what a negative addictions are, sure. is drugs and alcohol and sex and, and all those kind of things. And positive mm -hmm. addiction ha has to do with taking care of yourself. And what Glasser found is in his studies that people who were joggers or meditators or bicycle riders or swimmers or mm -hmm. people that did something intrinsically valuable, non-competitive, just for themselves for 45 minutes to an hour a day, uh, would get addicted to that, just like people who got to negative addiction. You, mm -hmm. you meet an exerciser that gets hurt and they can't exercise, you know, that uh, drives them crazy. They're honorary because sure. you're not letting them do what they're addicted to. Mm -hmm. and, and what I really push is us getting addicted to some habits that are really positive for us, that give us solitude, that give us time to think, and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. And so if you can be exercising in the morning as a way of solitude, that's great. But it's very different than running out of the house with your watch and checking your time and all. You're just into another type A competitive mm -hmm. right. of activities. I have a friend who's been a runner for 30 years in the morning, and people say, Jim, you know, how far do you run? He says, I don't know. And, uh, well, Jim, you know, how long do you run? He says, I don't know. He said, my running isn't about getting anywhere. It's just how I choose to enter my day. And uh, Jesus was great at the use of solitude, you know. He would go off by himself and, mm -hmm. and get himself centered. So at that, the complaints of others. That's right. A lot that's of right. work to be done here. Yeah. But he knew what he should be doing. Yeah, you mm -hmm. have to nurture yourself. Right. What two or three things uh, would you, uh, pieces of advice would you give to managers today? Well, the first one I would do is tell them to get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's, that's good. Watch their ego, which is edging mm -hmm. God out. And uh, um, so th I think the ego is a real uh, important issue. And then I think be real clear with people what you want to accomplish and mm -hmm. what's, what there is, because, you know, goal setting starts it all. Sure. And then once the goals are clear, you know, how do you wander around and catch them doing something right? You know, really got back to the basic one minute manager. Mm -hmm. But I do want to add one new one that I'm working on is which is the one minute apology. Mm. And I'm kidding. That's a new book. Yeah, I've kiddingly taught people I'm going to, you know, I think that's endorse a great it concept. to, uh, uh, you know, dedicate it to Clinton and Pete Rose and all. But uh, yeah, so once over easy <laughs> of the one minute apology. Well, is that what you really need to do is we make mistakes all the time because mm -hmm. we all fall short of perfection. And a lot of times people don't want to admit that they've made a mistake because it shows a weakness. Well, the reality is we're all weak. <laughs> we all sure. make mistakes. And the longer it takes you to admit that you've made a mistake, the quicker a weakness turns into a perceived wickedness. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we all have weakness, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, sometimes you'll get angry and lose your temper and, you know, storm out of somebody's office. The sooner you recognize, say, oh, my God, what I just did, and go back in and say, you know, hell is that I just want to tell you, my God, I just came in and took your head off and didn't even listen to you. Mm. And I want to apologize, you know, I feel awful about that. Uh, in fact, the reason I'm apologizing, I think I'm better than that, you know. Mm. I mean, you want to forgive yourself, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we got to do more apologies. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why quality is a problem and things are a problem in a lot of organizations is nobody wants to admit when they see something wrong because they think they'll get blamed for it or something happened rather than saying, wow, you know, we're going to make mistakes. Sure. And 
One of the greatest ways to create raving fan customers is to recover from a mistake. And by sincerely really it, right? apologizing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people think, well, you make a mistake. Well, if you admit it, you know, they're going to want money and all that. We have found from our research mm -hmm. is if you have somebody sincerely apologize for an error uh, when you're dealing with a customer, if that customer contact person says, is there anything that we can do to regain your loyalty. In eight out of 10 cases, the people will say, you've already done it. Mm. You've just listened to me. Most wow. people right. don't. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to throw money. People just, you know, we're all human. Well, you know, Ken, uh, we in this community and uh, around the world, actually, you have touched millions of people and been extremely helpful uh, to people. And I, I hope you know that. Uh, and I appreciate so much our friendship and so much your willingness to come on this program and uh, keep it up. And I'm looking forward to that one minute apology because that's a book I could really use as well. Oh, great. I love that. So thanks for being on the show today. Well, thanks, Megan. I appreciate what you're doing.